Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. wherever you may hail i'm your host john bruni welcome to the focus join us as we explore some of the world's most fascinating and essential contemporary developments shedding a spot of light in a world filled with alternative fact darkness in this episode we are joined from the u.s by journalist and author mike rothschild mike is one of america's foremost experts on QAnon, and will be speaking on some of the themes covered in his latest book, The Storm is Upon Us, How QAnon Became a Movement, Cult, and Conspiracy Theory of Everything. Mike, welcome to The Focus. Thank you for having me. Mike, let's start at the beginning. What does the term QAnon actually mean? Is it an acronym for something? Um, this is actually a more complicated question than you might think. So <laughs> the, the act, as, as all of these things are, so right. the term QAnon has two component parts. One is the Q and the other is the Anon. So Q was the code name for what claimed it was a military intelligence team working hand in hand with President Trump to enact an upcoming purge of the deep state that was being leaked to patriots through a series of cryptic clues on the image board 4chan and then later 8chan. This, uh, this team called themselves Q, uh, claiming that they had Q clearance. So uh, right there, there's a number of problems. Uh, Q clearance is an actual designation, but it's a Department of Energy term that has to do with uh, simply having some access to technology related to nuclear power. I know people who have Q clearance. It's not that big of a deal. The idea of the kind of secretive, ultra-sensitive Q clearance, that comes from a couple of different possible sources, uh, all of which are different rabbit holes to go down that we, we won't go down here. The anod part of it is simply means anonymous, and there is a long tradition on these boards of people coming in and pretending that they are these uh, important anonymous figures who are leaking details about something. So you had FBI Anon, you had White House Insider Anon, uh, there was an MI5 Anon leaking the secrets of British intelligence. All this stuff is made up. It doesn't mean anything. But the, the actual term QAnon is kind of the fusing of those two things. And it's also important to note that people who were under the QAnon umbrella, people who were believers in that movement, began to discard the term and they would later claim that they never used it, that it was made up by the mainstream liberal media to make them all look crazy. Now, never mind that they were using the term freely for many years. And in fact, the most popular pro Q book is actually called QAnon, an invitation to the great awakening. So any thought that these people never used this term is just, is just ridiculous. Mike, if you don't mind me saying so you, your surname um, seems to be one that is rather synonymous with various conspiracy theories as well. So would I be correct in saying you're almost the perfect person to write the the antidote, if I <laughs> if I can put it to you this way, with to to QAnon, right? Uh, a little too perfect, maybe. Um, <laughs> I uh, I am not related to the to the Rothschild banking family. My uh, my family comes from a completely different part of Germany. And what's interesting is I'm actually working on another book right now about the history of the Rothschild banking family mythos. Oh, good. Yeah. And one of the one of the things that I learned very early on in the process was that the people who are actually part of that family, and there are many, many members of the Rothschild family right now, they don't talk about this stuff. They don't do interviews about it. They don't talk about it publicly. I spoke to the head of the family archive in London, and she said that they don't do interviews about this because they don't want to have to prove a negative. 
you know, you can't prove that your family doesn't run every central bank in the world. The person making the accusation has to prove it. Of course, mm -hmm. that's not the way these people work. So what they what they do then is they just don't talk about it. They leave that to other people. So if I were actually related to the Rothschilds, I'd be the last person uh, going public to debunk any of this stuff. And you're only saying that because you're part of the Bilderberger group, right? Right, sure. And the Council on Foreign <laughs> Relations and the Trilateral Commission and the, you know, the New World Order. You know, I've got my, my buttons, uh, my jacket. It's, uh, I, I mean, th this stuff has always <sighs> been in our culture. And Q works really well because it picks up on things that have been around for a long time. So this yeah. idea of the super government, the shadow government, the insiders, that's all basic con conspiracy theory stuff. Q just adds a social media sheen to it and repackages it as something uh, uh, participatory and new that, that you get to be part of. But the component parts, as I write about quite a bit in the book, are very, very old, very uh, shop worn and and they're reused over and over because they work. So, Mike, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Was QAnon a symptom of modern social media, where the whole notion of objective truth is constantly under question, or was it because the American electorate was just so jaded by contemporary power politics as it was playing out in Washington D.C.? Well, the unfortunate answer is yes. It's all of those things. Uh, Hugh never would have been able to take off with the speed that it did without social media. And I think more accurately, without the complicity of the social media companies who allowed this to spread almost completely unchecked for years before finally doing anything about it. But it really also uh, spoke to a moment in our culture where we had a conspiracy theorist president. We had Donald Trump who rose to political power, not because of his experience or his ideas, but because he was going on The View and talking about uh, how Barack Obama's birth certificate was fake. And, uh, you know, there was a plane crash that killed the only Hawaiian health official who had the power to release it. I mean, he, he found something in right-wing American conspiracy culture that was very, very exploitable, and he exploited it. And so QAnon was an easy outgrowth of that because it really tapped into a lot of the stuff he'd been talking about. But it also set up Hillary Clinton as the figure who would finally be brought down. You know, the, the Clinton uh, conspiracy complex had been running for decades in the U.S., you know, going back to the early 90s. But finally, here was somebody who was going to take her down, who was going to make sure she got what she deserved. So Q really was the right conspiracy theory hitting at the right time in the right way. So there is no real coherent philosophy behind QAnon, right? There is no coherent storyline. The, the actual particulars of what were supposed to happen were constantly changing. But, but the, the philosophy behind it is actually rather consistent. It's There is a cabal of uh, unimaginably corrupt and evil insiders who have been lying to you about everything and oppressing you and keeping you down. And we're going to fix it. We're going to, we're going to change it. We're going to get rid of these people. And Trump is going to be the one who we've been waiting for this whole time. And he's finally going to do it. That, that's really the, the consistent mythology of Q, you know, the particulars of how this is all going to happen, when it's going to happen, that changes constantly. And that is a, a uh, kind of a hallmark of these kinds of prophetic movements. The thing that's supposed to happen is always the same. The way it's supposed to happen and when it's supposed to happen, that's constantly in motion. And only the guru at the very top knows for sure what it's, what it's going to look like when it happens. You mean the guy that's sitting at the 33rd degree somewhere in a great hall in a large city? Right. The, right. the, um, the grand the poobah. Right. The, the grand poobah, but for the white hats. So right. the black hats have been the Masons, the Illuminati, the Trilateral Commission, the Rothschild, Soros. The white hats are the patriots who are running this, this secret program. And Q is very much in line with many other gurus who claim to have this kind of secret knowledge. And you know, I write about this a lot in the book. With a lot of these things, it's a financial scam. It's mm. I know when the Iraqi dinars are going to reach their maximum value. It's, you know, I know when the great financial instrument is going to be released, 
with Q, it was, I know when Hillary Clinton and George Soros and Barack Obama are, are going to be arrested. So follow me if you want that to happen. And for so many people, that was just an irresistible message. Hmm. So could I say that the burden of proof now has become so difficult that the system has simply given up trying to explain why they do the things they do, knowing full well there are a number of people out there, a percentage of the population that simply won't listen because they've hooked up with QAnon? Yeah, I, I think the idea that we can uh, debunk or fact check or debate our way out of these kinds of movements uh, just misunderstands the way they work and misunderstands why people get into them. They, people get into these kinds of movements to have their grievances listened to. It's the feeling that somebody has been keeping me down. I have not gotten what I wanted out of life. Somebody is responsible for it and and they need to pay for it. That's such an emotional reaction that you can't meet that with facts. You know, there's a very popular QAnon video the one of many, and the first, I think it's, uh, I think it's out of the shadows. I can't remember which one. There's so many, but it starts off with this, this sort of gravelly voiced narrator. And one of the first lines in it is, "Do you ever wonder why you can't get ahead in life?" And everybody listening to that is going to go, "Uh huh. Of course, I wonder why I can't get ahead in life. I mean, what kind of question is that?" And so things like QAnon exploit that kind of grievance, that kind of feeling like I didn't get the life I was promised and someone is responsible for it. Yeah, yeah. So to what degree do American talk show hosts like Tucker Carlson or Alex Jones play in stoking these fires? Oh, and by they, the way, what, 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 sorry, what about Joe hmm. Rogan, who's, who's sort of always delicately balancing himself between the whack jobs on the one side and serious people on the other. He, he seems to have a niche all by himself, but I think that he also feeds into the whole QAnon or conspiracy theory setting, yeah? Yeah, and, you know, with Rogan, it's almost like you never know who you're going to get uh, depending on who the guest is. You know, I've, I've yeah. heard Rogan episodes that I think are fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. He did an interview with the director of the uh, documentary Q Into the Storm, which, uh, which I, I did a little bit on. I was interviewed for it. It didn't make the cut, but that was a terrific episode. And then he does mm. things that are just mind-bogglingly bizarre. Mm. With, th with people like Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones, it's not so much the endorsement of Q. I, I, I think Tucker Carlson has talked a little bit about it, always in the guise of like, well, what's wrong with asking questions? What's wrong with wanting to know the truth? And Alex Jones was very pro-Q, and then he was... Uh, very much against Q. I mean, and possibly because Q was getting more popular than he was. But what it is, is it's it's weaponizing that grievance of they don't want you talking about this. They don't want you answering these questions. These people think they're better than you and they don't want to be examined. So what are they trying to hide? Why don't they want us talking about it? So it's it's never about endorsing the bizarre belief. It's a, especially for a really mainstream host. It's about kind of endorsing the just asking questions, just trying to get the truth philosophy. Well, they are really powerful and they are really rich. So what are they trying to hide? It, it, it's, it's a very delicate balance. And of course, you'd see the same balance going on with um, mainstream conservative politicians in the US. It was very much not endorsing QAnon because it was way too weird for them to endorse, but it was also never pushing back against it. It was never saying, this is disgusting. We don't want this. This is not our party. It was always, well, people have questions. People are, are just looking for the truth. So it's that kind of wishy-washy, I'm not saying it is, I'm not saying it isn't. And so that is left up just to the individual viewer to interpret. All right. What role does free slavish following of freedom of the press mm -hmm. in the US have on all of this, you know, there is this notion that, well, if you are a, a, of reasonable mind, um, you have the right in this country to say what you like, and you have the right to have an audience to listen to whatever you want to say. I mean, is this also something that, you know, tends to also play into all of this you know, with, but without having that, you know, with freedom comes great responsibility that oft quoted Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So it, it's really tricky. And I, and I think you get into some very troubling free speech issues when you're talking about shutting some of this stuff down. But I think it's really important to understand that what a lot of these people think of as free speech is not the kind of speech most people want. This idea that social media should be, everybody gets to say anything they want and I and they can say back to me anything I want and we'll settle it with a vigorous debate. That almost instantly and constantly turns into uh, anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories, disinformation, organized harassment, organized uh, trolling and threats. That is not free speech. You know, calling in bomb threats to hospitals is not free speech. Uh, doxing people and having, you know, lunatics show up at your front door, that's not free speech. That, that's not, and that's not what most people want. Most people want to go somewhere where they can say what's on their mind, but where there are some guardrails and there are some rules. You know, you, you can't walk into a bar and start screaming at women and not think you're going to get thrown out. That, that's the way we treat public spaces. And I feel like we need to be treating private spaces the same way. Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, they have rules. And it's not as if these companies are saying you can't say this anywhere. When you get kicked off one of these sites, it's you can't say it here. We have rules. You broke them. And you go somewhere else that doesn't have these rules. There's plenty of places like that. It's just that most people don't want to go there because because there's no, there are no guardrails. There's no, um, there's no safety. And most people do not want to spend their online life being harassed and trolled and deluged with disinformation. But wouldn't you say that those people who then find themselves at the, you know, backside end of a social media channel, because they've been kicked out from their extreme views, those people would come back and say, yes, but you know, if it was Facebook or Twitter, it's a conspiracy theory at the highest level because they do not want to know the truth. And I am telling you the truth about whatever the, you know, yeah, situation the, the, happens to be. Yeah. 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 And that's a huge part of it. You know, the idea that these companies are, are in on it. Uh, one of the big things you see in a lot of the Q drops is, um, you know, allegations that Facebook is part of this conspiracy. You know, Mark Zuckerberg is, you know, purposefully throttling disinformation. I mean, the opposite was true. You know, we know from reporting, I think it was by the Washington Post, that Zuckerberg specifically didn't uh, deplatform Alex Jones because he didn't want to be seen as being uh, censorious of conservatives. And this is kind of where we are. We're now in a place where social media is just a battleground for conspiracy theories, for disinformation, for panic over you know transgender people, over vaccines. I mean, all of these things that most people didn't spend a lot of time thinking about are now kind of front and center in our faces all the time because there's no rules about what's being allowed on these sites. And if there are rules, they're not being enforced consistently. You know, Mike, a lot's been said on the 6th of January Capitol riots that most of the people who heeded Trump's rally, not rally, were QAnon supporters, including my favorite, Buffalo Man. So despite <laughs> the crazy conflicting theories they stand for, QAnon has nonetheless left a very profound mark on US politics, right? Absolutely. The, the iconography of QAnon was uh, was everywhere on January 6th. Yeah. You saw it on the, the shirts and the signs. And there's a, a, an example that doesn't get reported on much where a bunch of insurrectionists were destroying camera equipment that belonged to the Associated Press and screaming, we are the news now. That's a QAnon catchphrase. That nobody said that before QAnon invented that. So the the iconography of it was there, but more than that, the philosophy of it was there. That Donald Trump needs us to be his digital soldiers. And if that means overthrowing the government, if that means killing the vice president, then we will do it because he needs us. And we're gonna we're gonna be there for him. This idea of this kind of two-way back and forth between Patriots and Trump is is one of the building blocks of QAnon. You know, they they would talk constantly about the deltas. This idea that Q would post and then Trump would tweet, and it would be like seconds apart. And there was, you know, there's no way that this could be mathematically impossible. You know, I mean, I talk about in the book how like actually it is can completely be a coincidence. You know, Trump tweeted all the time, and if you posted something 
that was around the time when he usually tweeted, there's a pretty good chance they would go up at right around the same time. But it's just math. The, the things that they would post about would have nothing to do with what Trump was tweeting. It's just, it's just, you know, noise. But these people were desperate to believe that Trump had picked them to be his vanguard. And you saw an enormous amount of that on January 6th, this idea of he needs us and we're here for him. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast, and we're speaking with QAnon expert Mike Rothschild. So, Mike, if QAnon isn't a social movement and it's not a political party, it's a cult, a cult without a leader? It has a number of very cult-like tendencies. And one of the things I really wanted to get at with the book is when we use that term, are we using it correctly? Or are we applying the stereotypes that we've had of cults, you know, where it's a bunch of people in beige frocks tilling the soil and waiting for orders from their leader? There's a lot of ways that QAnon is not like that. But there are a lot of ways that Q is like a cult. It has that in-group versus out-group dynamic. It has the jargon. It has the shared understanding and the shared agreements and the shared language. It doesn't have a charismatic leader, but it has a messianic figure in Trump, who is the charismatic leader of what uh, many people would say is a very cult-like following. So it, it hits enough of the buttons of being a cult where I think you can talk about it as a cult, and I, and I don't think you're wrong for doing it, because I think what we think of as a cult is not necessarily how most cults are. It's not people in a compound who are brainwashed and, and you know can't leave. People do walk away from Q. You just don't want to, because if you walk away from it, you're going to miss out on the great events that's about to happen. It's just a few days away, or it's next week, and if you leave now, well, then it was all for nothing. And so eventually you have a movement where you, you can go, you just, don't have, you just don't have anywhere to go to. The power of QAnon is the fact that they take a kernel of truth and blow it out completely. And while at the same time, they are willfully blind to the inconsistencies of the weird narratives. But in terms of that, is that their ultimate focal point, you know, the idea that you can strip back all the fluff and dice, but ultimately there's always some little kernel of truth in there. And so therefore it's got to be true. You know, you, you, you make that kind of weird connection, right? Uh, like for instance, if we, if we go through some of the more famous conspiracy theories, like uh, something around Jeff Epstein and mm -hmm. Pizzagate, and sure. as you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton. Can you walk us through some of these sort of weird theories that do have a little bit of truth around them, which makes them very difficult to sort of, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Debunk. Yeah. So it, it's, it's much easier to debunk or dismiss a theory that is completely made up than it is to debunk or dismiss something that has a very small amount of truth to it, because then you fall back on that little piece of truth. So with something like Jeffrey Epstein, here was a guy who was not a good person and was connected in some very dark ways to a lot of very powerful people, including the Clintons. I mean, that, you know, that's not made up. That's, that's real. And then when you have his, his suicide, you have an event that is not supposed to happen. You know, he's not supposed to be able to kill himself. That, that can't happen. There has to be another explanation. And we find so often with conspiracy theories, they're based on something that, that isn't supposed to happen. The John F. Kennedy assassination, the 9-11 attacks, you look at it and go, that, that, that's unreal. That doesn't happen that, you know, planes don't just fly into towers, something else had to happen there. And so what what often happens is our lack of imagination for envisioning sort of worst case scenarios is transformed into conspiracy theories. And I think, you know, you can certainly say something with like that with Epstein. You look at the the factors that went into his suicide, you know, oh, the cameras weren't working. They must have been turned off. Well, it's a, you know. 30-year-old prison that probably hasn't been updated since it was built. There's no money for it. The cameras are broken all over prisons around America. The guards don't care. They're, you know, they're getting minimum wage. They, they, of course, they're going to fall asleep. They don't, it doesn't matter to them what happens. So 
you, you go and you find what actually happened. And each one of those little things can, can be explained. There's an explanation that's not as salacious, but it's much more rooted in reality. But when you keep throwing more and more things onto it, it gets harder and harder to explain all of them away. And so the conspiracy theory becomes the preferred explanation rather than this is a very common thing that's not that big of a deal. You know, there's some human failure here. There's some incompetence, but there's not a conspiracy because we want the conspiracy. We want there to be a plot because that's a better explanation. And of course, you know, people are usually oblivious to the fact that there are these black swan events that come out from left field. No one's been anticipating them. And then, of course, as you rightly point out, you know, you've got, um, you know, situations where systems don't work as efficiently and effectively as they otherwise would. And so we can be uh, sideswiped quite, quite quickly by something that we just weren't prepared to encounter. Yeah. Right. And that's that's exactly it. And, and of course, we saw that with the pandemic. You know, people are saying, oh, this is unprecedented. You know, this, there's no way this could have happened naturally. Well, actually, there is. I mean, there, you know, we get hit by pandemics. Like every hundred years or so, we have a disease that just spreads through, through the culture. It just happens. And if you look at the technical failures, the political failures, the cultural failures, but then you have to start blaming people that you maybe don't want to blame. You maybe have to look at President Trump and say, he could have done more here. And he didn't do it. You have to look at the Chinese government and say they weren't honest with what was going on. You know, we don't want human failure because then it's like, well, there was nothing we could do. You want there to have been something you could have done and it and you couldn't, you know, it was you were prevented from it because of their because of the new world order. It's easier to blame the new world order than it is to blame incompetence or random chance. Oh, yeah, definitely. So how dependent is the Republican Party on QAnon supporters? Are they as powerful a group as we outside the United States believe they are? I don't know that they are particularly dependent on QAnon itself at this point because, you know, Trump is not in power and because the Q poster has mostly been silent over the last almost two years now. What they are completely dependent on is the conspiracy theory behind QAnon, that that belief that the election was stolen, COVID was a hoax, cancel culture is the biggest threat facing us all. Those conspiracy theories are a huge part of QAnon, but they can exist without QAnon. And, and they're doing a very good job of existing without QAnon. So those things now all combine together to create a kind of, as I talk about, conspiracy theory of everything. And that theory of everything is really a foundational belief of the modern Republican Party. I don't think you can be a prominent Republican now and believe that vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, Joe Biden won the election. Uh, cancel culture is not that big of a deal. And, you know, everything is generally fine. You can't you can't prosper in today's American Republican Party if you think all those things, because nobody wants to hear that they want to hear. Uh, Biden lost and, you know, is only president through massive fraud. COVID was invented by the Wuhan Institute and spread around by Bill Gates. They want to believe that. It's not a question of being given the facts. They don't want the facts. They want, they want their facts and they're not going to give them up. Is there any evidence at all that this QAnon phenomenon is part of some sort of Russian disinformation campaign? The only country that really benefited from the chaotic, incoherent Trump years was Vladimir Putin. Or is this just another conspiracy theory from non-American QAnon people? Uh, there is really no evidence that, that QAnon had any particular link to Russian disinformation or, or Chinese disinformation or Iranian disinformation. There, there's just nothing there. There was a little bit of early boosting of certain QAnon hashtags that was done by accounts that were linked to the Internet Research Agency, but it was a very small percentage. It was something like 10 to 15 percent of, of QAnon tweets at the very beginning. And of course, all of the QAnon influencers are either American or Western or, you know, or English speaking. Uh, so all of these gurus who took QAnon's content and ran with it in their own direction, they're all English speaking. Most of them are easily identifiable. Uh, they're not Russian trolls. They're just American grifters. And Americans have a, um, 
a, a really unique ability to get sucked in by conspiracy theories, it, much more so than many other cultures. We just, we love plots. We love schemes. We love thinking that there's somebody out to get us. We always have, you know, the, the buttons that QAnon pushed are homegrown American Republican evangelical conspiracy theorist stuff that's been around for a long, long time. It didn't, it didn't need any stoking from Vladimir Putin. Okay, so have we ever been in this situation before historically, Mike? I mean, has there been a time when a country was so thoroughly divided based on pushing nonsensical narratives? Well, you know, America has had times when it's been divided. You know, certainly you go to the Civil War and the immediate aftermath of that. But this false narrative, this idea that, you know, half the country thinks Joe Biden didn't actually win the election, We've never been there before. We've always been able to agree on certain basic, not moral issues, but factual issues. You know, who is the president? What is what is actually going on here? Um, is this disease real or engineered? I mean, we, we've always been able to agree on sort of basic facts, and we just differed in our interpretation of those facts. We are now not even agreeing on whether up is up and down is down. And I don't know how we carry forward as a country when we are so incredibly divided on the very basics of what, of what reality is. Um, you know, you've got half of this country living in its own reality. And of course that half thinks that the other half is living in its own reality. So it, it, is, uh, it is a precipice that we are uh, rapidly approaching and that I don't know that we have any real way of getting off of. I recall watching you have a uh, YouTube interview with, um, oh, let me see, is it Mike Shermer, the yes, head of Michael the Shermer. Skeptics Group? Yeah. Yes. So, so anyway, uh, in that, um, the question was posed to you, how does one combat the growing allure of QAnon? And you were talking about the fact that if you were with Uncle Bob at the kitchen table and Uncle Bob is pushing a particular QAnon line, you had the capacity to get up from the table and say, listen, Uncle Bob, love you dearly, but if you continue down this path, I'm getting out of here. Is that really the only way that we can start shutting some of this, you know, conspiracy theory philosophy down? Or is there another way? Well, I think that's the most effective way. You know, the the idea of um, getting people out of these movements, de-radicalizing people, it, it's uh, it's a very uh, slow-moving study because it's so difficult. Everybody's journey into a conspiracy theory is a little bit different, and therefore everybody's journey out of a conspiracy theory has to be a little bit different. And I really think that if we're going to figure out a way out of this moment, we do need to be having those conversations with the people in our lives, with the people who are closest to us, not screaming at random strangers on Twitter. That, that doesn't do anything. But if you have that person in your life, you have the right to say, I love you dearly, but I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about QAnon. I don't want to talk about how Trump really won. If you want to talk about that, that's fine. You go do that somewhere else. But we're going to have a civil conversation. We're going to talk about things that we enjoy together, but not about politics or conspiracy theories. And if you can't abide by that, then we can't have a conversation. And I think that idea of drawing boundaries, drawing lines of what we're willing to talk about, what we're willing to uh, sort of put up with, especially on social media, that's, that's gonna be the way we get out of this. And if you wanna stay in that person's life, that's, that's great, but you have to do it in a way that is safe for you, that makes you feel like you are valued it's not just you know taking that person's abuse, taking that those person's wild conspiracy theories. It's saying, "I love you. I want you to be part of my life, but not with this." So when you're ready to talk about something else, I'm here. And if they do start to kind of see the cracks in the conspiracy movement, then you've offered yourself up as that safe person, as a person who they can talk to, they can maybe find some common ground with, because a lot of other people are just going to say goodbye. I don't want anything to do with you and completely shut them off forever, which is okay too. But if you want that person in your life, you have to be that, that landing spot for them. And that's really, really hard because your, your instinct is always going to be to just dismiss them, call them crazy and block them. 
because that's what we do all day on social media. We've got crazy people and we block them. Yep. So it's, it's hard and, and it has to be done at a very small scale, very personal level. Is there any form of, I don't know, government derived education that can be put out there at a social political level that can actually knock some of this stuff on its head? Or, or is that just, you know, uh, mill for the grist for the conspiracy theorists out there? Well, I think, unfortunately, anything that comes from the government is going to be regarded with suspicion. You know, we, we have this, this weird moment in America right now where for a long time, the conspiracy theory machine saw the office of the president as just another uh, puppet of the Illuminati. They're, you know, they're all corrupt. They're all, you know, they're all in the pocket of Jewish power. Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. You know, they hated George H.W. Bush as much as they hated Bill Clinton. That really all changed with Donald Trump. And they looked at him as this messianic figure. And now, of course, they've gone back to Biden and the, you know, the loathing is, is there more than ever. So anything that comes from that kind of government is immediately going to be regarded with suspicion. Where I think there is a role for government is enforcing some of the laws that we have, particularly laws about harassment, laws about um, you know, threats, things like that but also working with the social media companies to, to ensure that there is a healthier discourse on these major platforms, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. You know, you're never going to see the government regulating a place like 8chan. You know, that, that's, you know, 8chan exists because people want unregulated speech there. But most people don't want that. Most people want somewhere where they know they can, you know, talk to people safely. So I think there is a role for government there. But, you know, I, when the uh, Biden administration started to roll out the uh, disinformation combating board, it was a disaster. And I knew it was going to be because people look at the government as a source of disinformation. It's like, well, if the government's telling me something's fake, I know it's real. You know, that kind of distrust is, is very uh, is very American in a lot of ways. Mike, thanks for sharing your insights on the focus with of us. Of course. Thank you for having me. Journalist and author Mike Rothschild. If you would like to know more about this fascinating topic, I highly recommend you buy Mike's book, The Storm is Upon Us, How QAnon Became a Movement, Cult, and Conspiracy Theory of Everything, available at all good bookstores or online purveyors of the written word. That's it for this episode. We hope that you enjoyed the show. My thanks to our guest, Mike Rothschild, and producers Neil Smart and Malcolm Hughes. Thanks also to the Ozcast Network. You can find the focus on the Sage International website at sageinternational.com.au, hitting the Media Center drop down menu and clicking podcasts. The focus can also be heard on the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Audible, and iHeartRadio. So if you like what you've heard, please like and review us on your favorite podcast platform. Every subscription we get or thumbs up you give helps the algorithm bump us up the digital ladder. And no, that's not a conspiracy theory. Until next time, I'm John Bruni, and you've been listening to Sage International's The Focus. Safeway for great spring savings throughout the store. This week at Safeway, get yellow peaches or nectarines for the member price of $1.88 per pound. Also this week at Safeway, value packs of Signature Farms chicken drumsticks, thighs, leg quarters, or picnic packs are buy one, get one free. Plus, get value packs of USDA choice boneless beef top sirloin steak for the member price of $4.99 per pound. Visit Safeway.com, download the Safeway for You app, or head in store to find more great deals at Safeway. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.